Well, no, thank you for inviting me here. Because it's nice to see so many friends. It's also sad, you know, the, uh, the, to think about the occasion for the uh, talk. Um, I met Vadim several times, in, I, I, in, you know, over. We had these fantastic meetings, the Landau Nordita meetings. And uh, I think he was not there the first time, but he probably was there, I mean, in 84. And I, w I remember one episode from 1984. We had one of these marvelous parties in someone's apartment. And we were, I don't know, 30 people or 40 people in, in a two room apartment. Yeah, I think that that time it was. That's true because it was not such as it was. It was no, no. That was in eighty one. No, it was. Anyhow, so it was completely crammed, and there were two sober people, and that was Vadim and Paolo de Vecchia, and they were sitting, you know, like that, and they were discussing, and eventually they wrote a paper. So that was. <coughs> then the last time I saw Vadim was when we were in in. Um, in Japan in October of 1987. Uh, and he was, we were a few people, Dan was there also, and the two Sashas. And, and, and Vadim took a, a, a great responsibility there, I would say. He gave several talks and he was really on top of everything. And then just, I guess it was a month later, I got this letter from, from Sasha telling me about what had happened, which was extremely sad. But I'm really glad that we can honor him here by this talk. <coughs> I have to tell you now that what I'm going to talk about is essentially what I talked about in Paris almost a year ago. I have been completely out of business f for good reasons, as you know, uh, for the last six months or so. And I've not been able to do And this is, <coughs> this is not, you know, um, uh, leading to any great conclusion of what I'm going to say. But it's, it's something that I've been thinking about. I mean, the, the origin of what I'm going to say goes back actually to what I was talking about, you know, in 1984 in this Lando uh, Nordita meeting. So, um, but it's, it's coming back to, you know, all these beauties that we see in N equals 4 and in N equals 8 supergravity. Uh, and <coughs> I think my message will be that there, there is more to it than we, we have seen before. So let me see if I can get some. I wanted to do it a bit interactively. So I will have some formula here and then I will have my extra blackboard up there. So <coughs> I'm going to do something very simple. Now, now to start with, just think about young Mills. So I will write, well, so you, I start with that. And then I will um, essentially just um, consider the, the light con gauge, which is that A plus, well, let me put a gauge index is equal to zero. And I'm going to, to use uh, a notation where I write x plus minus and I will use x plus as the time and then del minus is the conjugate. That will mean also that del plus is just a space derivative. Um, okay, and also I, I will I will also use the notation that x is so if I introduce this here, and then. In the functional integer, I can add and subtract, and then what I will find is that um, I will get that so del plus a minus a will be something like um, the well. Actually, I can now. What I'll do is that I will now 
switch on the next slide so you will see um, so I will have this expression that is di a uh, and then there is a term which is g f a b c 1 over del plus a b i del plus a c i well actually I will eventually also go over to, 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 to an expression I have a and a bar and the, the <coughs> here I have 1 over del plus which is of course a non-locality so this is a non-locality along the Lycon but it's uh, there's nothing really dangerous about that. So I will have lots of expressions with, 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 like that. Um, so if I just do this, and I, I introduce it back into the, into the action, I get an expression like the one upstairs. And um, so you recognize that it's an ordinary kinetic term, but you know, we have to interpret as I said, del plus is the time. This is a three-point coupling and complex coordinate, and a four-point coupling like that. Uh, so, but I, you know, this is really a, a, a formalism which is working on shell. So what I will do is that I will really look at equations of motion. Uh, and So if you look at this equation of motion, so minus i del minus, this is really like p minus, well, on, on a, p minus on a, a. So this, <coughs> but of course, this thing, this is really the, the uh, momentum operator acting on that which means that this is one of the generators of the Poincaré uh, algebra. And we will interpret this, this really as a right here as the variation with respect to this generator of the field. And uh, if, I, if I write that, I wonder why, why there's this reflection down here. But that's you will see an expression like that. So, so this operator, this generator, uh, is then non-linearly realized on the field. So this is the kinetic term up there. And so I have a, uh, which the three-point coupling gives this term. And I write complex conjugate there. It's not the complex conjugate of that, but if you go back, one step, you see that here, here is a term which has a, a bar a, and here is another one which has a bar a, a. And when I take the, the equation of motion with respect to a, I vary with respect to a bar. So this term is, is, we know it, which means that I'm not going to bother about this term. I, I, know, I know what it is. Uh, once I know this term, I know that term. Not directly, I have to go via the Lagrangian. But. So now you can go back and you can find all the Poincaré uh, generators acting on the field. And you get a, a completely sort of group theoretical approach. Um, and every generator that has a minus component will be dynamical and hence nonlinear. So it's a nonlinear realization of the Poincaré. Algebra, for example, the, 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 this, this is the spin uh, operator. It has this term, uh, minus one. This is just telling you that it's a spin one field. So that's the only, only thing you see from the spin part when you, when you act here in this way. And um, so what we did it, at this time, 30 years ago, was that we somehow abstracted out from this formalism uh, how to write so that any higher spin, um, you just find these representations, you find this generator, 
And of course, we also have to look at the other generators. And the, um, so I will write, there is, these are the dynamical ones, are what I call this and this. So, so I've complexified this also. This is into the transverse direction, but it's a minus direction. This, uh, you see, it's, it will have x plus del minus minus x minus del plus. But we can always put x plus equal to 0. We do the algebra at x plus equal to 0. So then th this is trivial. So we only have to worry about this guy, this guy, and this, um, what I call p minus. So to find any field theory, in a sense, you know, massless field theory to start with, you only have to find th these generators and make sure that they transform correctly with the, the, the uh, kinetic generators. And uh, in this way, you can, you know, it's just algebraically, you, you, you construct any of the, the known uh, field theories. And I even, I think, I gave a talk when Poincaré was 150 years old. I gave a talk called, you know, field theory as representations of the Poincaré algebra. So, uh, so these are all just representations of his algebra. So it looks, you know, completely group theoretic. And so this is a different way of looking at field theory. Uh, and this is what I thought all the time that uh, this was, say, a completely gauge fixed version. And you can imagine that on on another planet, you know, somewhere in the Milky Way, where you, you, you have some creatures that th this is, might have been the way that they constructed field theory. Th they might not have worry about gauge invariance. And they have just, because what we are dealing with here are just the phys physical degrees of freedom. So we have an A and A bar, we have two degrees of freedom. And uh, of course, <coughs> This was the starting point for when we did n equals 4. And, and by doing n equals 4 like that, we could prove that it was finite in, in perturbation theory. This is what I discussed you know, in, in 84 in, in, um, in Moscow. Um, and, uh, but then you can ask, what happens when you go to gravity? What, what does gravity look like in this way? Um, and you see, the, again, what you will do is that we, we just have to find, you start with finding this three-point coupling. And in fact, I will show it to you up there. It's a very simple expression, the three-point coupling. You see, it's really binomial coefficients in a sense here. And that's why it's very easy to, to generalize this to, to, to higher spins. Because you, you know, the number of derivatives here just tells you what the um, helicity is essentially. Um, so this is the three-point coupling. Then, of course, there's a four-point coupling, which is much more complicated. Um, but you can get a lot of information from the three-point coupling. And and so this is what I'm going to to look at. I will now make things a bit more complicated, I will introduce some m much more general formalism where I write this expression essentially like that. I introduce this operator. It's an exponential in this del bar or del plus um, with factor a. So what I'm doing here is that I just expand this to power a square, take the derivatives, and then you, I also have wrote with more general expressions here for the del pluses, but um, don't look too much into that. Then what you find then is that um, this is a very compact way of doing things because we can do it for any spin at the same time. And it's also a, a very good way of doing it because all these kinetic generators which we have, which gives you, you know, tells you about the helicity or whatever, uh, they are automatically satisfied. So you only have to find, once you write this expression like that, you have to write these two generators in a certain form, and then you, you, you just check the algebra that it satisfies the Poincaré algebra. Um, okay, 
There are no indexes on, on H, S sorry. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. So, 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 yeah. so this is sort of, an, in a sense, an index-free formulation. Um, and, uh, okay, so, and when you do it like this, it looks very unique. Uh, you can, so you can, in principle, construct ordinary gravity this way. Uh, it's hard to, to, to guess if you would like, if you had to guess this four-point coupling here, it's hard and it's a lot of calculations to do to check that it works, but th this is a way of constructing it and it looks unique, as I said. But <coughs> the question you can ask is that since we have a dimensionful coupling constant here, we can also allow for terms with more derivatives. So what happens if we look at the corresponding terms with four derivatives? Uh, and then, of course, you can see immediately that what you have to do is that you have to add in one del bar and one del in order to have the right helicity. So the form of the expression is um, very natural. Now, in, uh, what I do is, th th this was this exponential I told about. I'm now introduced both an, an exponent here, a, a coefficient with for del bar and one for del. So I write this expression. Now you see A3 means that there are three del bars and one del. So this is the expression we start. And then, since we have done this many times, we know the this is the expression for the dynamical part, so to speak, in these two generators. Um, then look at this one. So there are two coefficients here, which are, in principle, unknown. Uh, but, but this is the form they have to be in order to satisfy all the other generators. So, so the, the only generators we have to check is how these three uh, commute with each other. So we do that, and um, then we got a, big, a bit of a surprise, I would say, because we got solutions for all values of n and m. So we got infinitely many terms possible here, um, for this. So this was sort of against what I was saying before, that it this was a fully fixed gauge uh, theory, f f fully fixed gauge, yeah. And uh, that, you, that the algebra should give you everything. Somehow it doesn't, because somehow why? We had thought, you know, naively that we would get um, two terms here, because in principle, you know in gravity that there should be two counter terms at one loop level. Uh, you know, this is this famous calculation of Tuft and Weltmann. You, you essentially have an R squared, and you have an R mu nu, R mu nu. You don't have the R mu nu rho squared because of uh, the gauss bonnier terms. So you should have get two terms. And so we were very mystified by this. this Check this calculation 100 times, you know, whether we had done any mistake, but no, we couldn't find them. And in fact, another virtue of this formula is that this generalized to, to, to any, to any higher order counter term. Um, you know, we, the only thing we have to do is that we have to add more derivatives. But it's the same calculation because, you know, it, we do the calculations regardless of what, is, what it says here, so to speak. So we can do all counter terms, all higher order counter terms in the same calculation. And um, we only have, to, have to, to, to vary this M and N according to this rule. So this is the, the spin of, of, of the, um, or the, the loop border, I should say. So if you take a 137 loop, uh, you just have to put L equals to 137. And, and this is the type of term you have there. Um, OK. And you will have you know, a fantastic number of derivatives. But it's still, the algebra is working. Um, so. Um, 
that was a problem. So we have to go back to the drawing board again to see what are we missing? I mean, I, I've been telling you that you, you could do field theory by just doing group theory, and something is missing here. So let's go back. Well, no, I have to tell you one more thing. Of course, we also know that um, these terms are zero on shell. So uh, how is that implemented here? Well, it's implemented in a, well, it, this looks a bit difficult. But remember th that the equations of motion for, for this field is this, in my way of writing it. So consider if I look at this box acting on, on an expression like that. Let me do it over here. So, so essentially what I'm doing is that I have a box on something with an H and an H. So this is um, del plus del minus minus del del bar acting on, but, uh, and I'm going to use the equations of motion because, um, yeah, of course, I, when I use the equations of motion, I get higher order terms, but I'm not worrying about those terms. So, when, so I have to do Leibniz rule here, but I w well, every time that this guy acts here, I will get the corresponding term there. So that will not give. So the only type of expressions that we have to worry about is this, term like that. But for that we use the equations of motion, so we say that that is del del bar over del plus. And then there are terms whether it's a del h and del bar h like that. And if you put all these terms together you'll see that it's again, so I do it here in more general, I put it it's again of, of the same form as I have. I just have to change the del pluses and um, which derivative I take, so to speak. So if I put this back, I would say that uh, if I have any, this is the, the starting in, in the equations of motion. Here I, I have a, a typical counter term. Uh, if it's of this form, I can just use this formula to rewrite this guy as one with the box up there. Um, and then I make a field redefinition like this. And then we absorb it. So by field redefinition, we can absorb all these um, counter terms that I've shown, which, of course, we, we should. Because, I mean, among those, there should be the, the, the correct ones. And they are zero on shell. So everything is zero on shell. Um, so, uh, then you might ask, how on earth would you ever be able to get the counter term, which is, is non-zero on shell? Because you know at the, at the next level, at the two loop, there should be a term which goes like, essentially cubed, so to speak. You're, well, if you go back and look at this expression here, here you see it. In order for the, a term like that to be, so you, be, you would be able to write it like that, you have to have both of the derivatives. Suppose I don't have a, a, this derivative, say, then I cannot do it because I cannot have it to, to q minus 1. So the only way to have a counter term is that if it's only written in terms of one type of derivative. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, did I, what? Let me see. Okay. Sorry, I did. Oh, I, I blew it. Um, I missed that slide somewhere. It, I don't know where it's gone. So the point is that I can have a term a counter term, which the, 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 if it's of the following form, I can have a term which goes essentially like six of those. Wait a minute. No, I can have a term like that. That will have helicity too. 
And that has derivatives only one term, one type. So such a term I can write down. I can check it. And when I do that, then in fact, you know, we, we find a unique result there. Um, so we can find the two-point the two coupling term we can find, and that's unique, and it's zero. Uh, it's non-zero on shell. But let's go back to this problem that we had, um, because that's... Well, so let checking Yang Mills. This is what I said we did. We, we chose this gauge, and we eliminated uh, these fields th through this equation. So the question is then, how much have we fixed the gauge? Well, so this is the, 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 the gauge invariance that we start with. Of course, in order to still be in that gauge, we have to demand that this um, should satisfy this condition. We also have to demand, you know, that any variation should um, uh, be invariant under, uh, well, this should be invariant under one. That means that we have to, to solve for this. But this means, you know, that there is a, a sort of a remaining gauge invariance in the theory, even though we, it's fully fixed. And in young miss we never use it. So, so, so the lesson is that <coughs> there must be some, some kind of, of invariance in the system which um, Poincaré didn't know about, so to speak. And how would, it, wh how would we do that? Um, yeah. Well, before I say that, there is one thing. So if we still have some kind of gauge invariance here, one should be able to write this in a gauge invariant way. So if, if you go back to this expression that I had up here, one can check you know, this invariance. But can we write it in a covariant form? Well, in fact, what we, we can, because what we can do is that we can introduce this sort of covariant derivative, which looks like this, and it has a term like that. And then, you know, since th this, th the transformations we do uh, satisfy this condition, it doesn't really matter if it's a del plus there or a one over del plus. So, so this is certainly gauge covariant under this remaining gauge invariance. And writing like that, we find an expression for, the, for this p minus, which we also call the Hamiltonian, as a quadratic form like that. So this is, in this way, the, this is the whole expression for, for young Mills in this way of doing it, which is, I think, very nice. Because we have not been able to, to really use it. We have been trying. but. Um, it's still, I, 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 you can always you know, imagine that you, perhaps one can now make a co complicated field redefinition and it, it, re it, it would really look like a, field, a free theory in a sense. Uh, and then you would put every, all the dynamics into the measure in the functional integral. Uh, it doesn't really help. But, uh, but it's, it, it, it's good to know that uh, for, for young males you have this expression. Uh, and then if we check the gravity case, it can also be written in this form. So there must be some kind of invariance left there. The, this, um, and then what is that? So one can go, the, the, what one can do is one can start um, with, with the covariant form and try to, to really check, look at all the equations, look at all the, the fields that you that we have eliminated and try then to, to find uh, that image. That's a very complicated way. But one can make a shortcut, but you, because you can guess that part of the remaining gauge invariance, what it would look like. And it's rather natural that it, because of helicity, this is essentially the only form it can have. So I introduce a parameter here, xi, which has um, helicity 1. Um, uh, and and um, then this is the form you can write. And I in, uh, use this condition and I also introduce that. So this xi is the xi of x bar. So this is, I thought I changed it. This is sort of one, 
Well, I, I'm, I'm just saying that this is a remaining gauge invariance because it's not the whole. But we only need to know enough, you know, to, to, to be able to to, um, to select the right terms. Um, but of course, there's a problem with this symmetry, which uh, and it it does not close. So these are infinitesimal uh, transformations that we can do, which the um, the theory should be invariant under. If you tr if we try, you know, to look at the closure of it, we will get back to s into some mess. But in order to just check, it's enough to know this. Um, it, I, I shouldn't say this. The, uh, this is the, we don't know exactly what this means because since. Since it's not a closing symmetry, we cannot really use it uh, sort of as a geometry. But uh, what happens is that it will really select the right type of terms for us. So when we check, you know, all these one loop counter terms we have, it turns out that there's just one left. And now you see. What, uh, so these were the expressions, and it's only one combination of n and m namely this one, uh, that survives. So now we're down to just one term, but we were supposed to have two. <coughs> and um, so that could be a bit of a headache. But it's a simple solution to that. I, I said that it should be two. However, you know, this is just at the three-point level. <coughs> if you go to the four-point level, you, you would see two. But at the three point, those two expressions would give the same. So, um, but it means that we have, it, it works. Th that's the way to do it. And um, um, let me see. So now uh, here I have th this expression for the for the two loop, it should be of this form covariantly. And as I said, there is only one type of term we can have, someone which we I call B6, which means that it's exactly of this form. So you so see, you know, that's an H with an H bar and H bar. And, then, uh, and the, the Poincare, Poincare algebra gives you this unique um, solution. And if you check this gauge here, it works. So, um, so it's um, so somehow. I mean, we've understood what was the problem, and and the so, so, so my, the new lesson is that is you know it's not enough just to close Poincaré. So Poincaré didn't. I mean, Poincaré didn't know about counter terms. I mean, he didn't know about. So it, it's not enough to just use group theory in order to select, um, say, a general theory for spin 2 and higher. So, so what are then th these other invariant terms? So what this gauge, this remaining gauge invariance, what does it do? It doesn't take away you know, unphysical degrees of freedom. But what it does is that it's selecting, us, selecting the spin 2 from higher spins. So, um, so that's what it, uh, it has a different role here. It's it's assuring you that that we get just spin two, because the other ones are some kind of invaders from higher spin. Th th those terms that we wrote um, could be terms coming from from higher spins, uh, and th th we have to somehow get rid of them. And that's what we we. Um, uh, so, so in that sense, you might say that, um, in a sense, you can go back to, to Poincaré, that Poincaré would have solved this, because the, the idea is, of course, that the, the way we do it, it's, it, you cannot really, you cannot check immediately that you have spin two fields in those terms. Um, so this is the uh, sort of the criteria for keeping that, but it looks like you use this remaining gauge invariance. You, ha you have to use some kind of local invariance in order to do it, in order to select that. So that comes on top of all the, the, the Poincaré generators. 
So um, when people are now interested in higher spins, we, are, we were really trying to get rid of the higher spins. So this is the way of getting rid of the higher spins. OK, so. But you know, this remaining uh, invariance looks like a very sore algebra. So at some stage, I thought, but it does not close. Um, and we have not been able to, 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 to really find a, a two-dimensional local algebra that works. Um, it's not clear that it should exist. It would be nice, you know, and, and um, I've been discussing with Sasha at some stage uh, that, that there might be some. There is something in, in also in, in, in this gravity theory that we don't see by the eye, which is there, you know, and, 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 and the, we've we get it from from um, uh, this local invariance, but but it's I haven't really presented it in the best possible form. But as I said, um, I've been out of business for some time, so I've not been able to think about it. But this, so, so the message in in, in, the, in the gravity case is that that th there is something doing it in this form, which is very much stripped down to the uh, bare bones. You only use the um, real degrees of freedom. Um, you, you have to, um, to do something else. And it was, this, this was just a simple exercise, though we started just because we wanted to, to see what is the corresponding expressions in n equals 8 supergravity. Um, and then, I'm not going to be able to say so much about it, but in n equals h supergravity is described by a field which no indices is just an x, and, and you have eight thetas. And if you expand it, you have all the supermultiplet in it. So it's a beautiful way, you know, you, can all, you, you just have to, to write the whole expression in terms of this phi. This phi satisfy sort of a chirality constraint and what we would call an inside out. So you see that if that is sort of symmetric, you take the co uh, complex conjugate and you turn it around and you get it back. You, you have h bar there, you have h, you have psi bar there, psi. So it, it satisfies a rather uh, uh, strict constraints. And this chirality constraint, for example, shows <coughs> will show immediately that uh, we will not be able to, to take this counter term over to supergravity because th then it would mean that it on this side we will have a delta phi and here we will have phi but this is satisfying a chirality condition, and this has the opposite chirality, so it's not going to work. So, so, of course, this people know from the beginning of supergravity that there are no two loop counter terms in supergravity. It all also works for n equals 1. But he, here it's obvious, so, so you see that it's much more um, uh, constrained here. I, I was also saying that in gravity, and in, in, in young males, you have this nice way of writing the Hamiltonian, this p minus, as a quadratic form. In, in n equals 4, and in young males, and n equals 8, it works the same. And there it, it, it sort of has a meaning. Um, if you look at the supersymmetry algebra, uh, then I will write it in the following way. I write one, which I, I divide up the spinner into 1 plus and 1 minus. This is what I call the kinematical one. This is the one which just gives you p plus, which is the number. This is the guy which gives you a p minus, which is the Hamiltonian. And then the mix is like that. So this expression is, again, you know, like, the, so the square root of the Hamiltonian is like the supersymmetry. So you can use this. If, if you use this in the integral form, one can rewrite this Hamiltonian in the following way. Again, as a quadratic form. You see, this is an expression which is just this supersymmetry, this non-linear supersymmetry transformation on that. And the, it's complex conjugate. And there is some kind of measure here. So th 
you can write the whole su <coughs> n equals eight supergravity in this very compact form, uh, which um, and you also know what this guy is, namely. It, it is a part of the algebra, even. So it's a very constrained form. Um, you also know that it should be E7 invariant. And at, in this level, you need, in, in, in this formulation, E7 is not just sort of a gauge, uh, uh, a duality symmetry. It's, it's a real symmetry of, of, the, of the Hamiltonian. It, all the fields are transformed. Even the, the fermions are transformed under E7. And um, so it's um, a very constrained form. And then you might ask, <coughs> um, what would this remaining gauge invariance do in n equals 8? And this is where I am. You know, I'm, I'm just going to tell you that this field, I'm, I'm just writing this to impress you, because don't look at the details. It has to be invariant under, first of all, there is this what is left from the reparameterization. This is what is left from the, um, from the uh, local supersymmetry. Uh, uh, this is what's left from the, from the gauge invariance. And, and then, of course, it has to be a chiral field. It's, this is a very complicated thing. And the question is, this algebra, you know, it looks uh, like an and N equals eight super Virasoro if you really look at the details. Unfortunately, as I said, it doesn't really, it does not close. So it's, it's, it's not a good algebra. And I, I don't know how to do it, but we were never able to, to do N equals eight super Virasoros in the old days. But here we have, you know, here we are building a two dimensional theory into a four dimensional one, and we somehow have parameters from the four-dimensional world, which can help us do these things. Um, so this is uh, sort of group theoretically. It's interesting if one can, if we can do something like that. I don't know if I can do it. And, and um, as I say, uh, I've not been able to look at it for the last eight months or so. But so I will stop here, but, and I will not give you any nice results apart from that. This is my own deliberations in a sense, but it, it really tells me, I think, that there is this very huge symmetry which is underlying these theories. It's the same, you know, with n equals four. That n equal, in these, this formalism, n equals eight is very much like the square of n, n equals four. The superfield is the square of it, and, and you know, the, you can, all these things that people have been trying to, which you also see in, in amplitudes, um, you see here already you know, at the level of the construction. Um, I think there is a lot of things here which I have not understood, which perhaps will tell us something. Um, and I, unfortunately, I've not been able to do more than this. So let me stop there. Uh, question, please. Uh, did you try to, what if you apply this uh, methods and ideas to Vasilyev theory? What would happen? Uh, you try yes. to avoid high speed, but uh, no, no, you can do it. But what, yeah, what but but this is th this is Minkowski. I mean, he's using anti here. But um, but you, no, but it's also interesting to look at these higher spins because you, what you really find is that you cannot um, when you once you go above spin two, you really have to have all the the, the higher spins. And, and one can write very nice formula like the ones I had, you know. Uh, for, for these terms, uh, symmetry for, for higher spins. Um, and um, I don't know what to do with it, but it, it's... It, it Maybe it will close <coughs> in this case. Maybe it will close. I don't know. Yeah. Thank you. Can you do this analysis in 11-dimensional supergravity? Um, well, you can, but you know... Uh, um, you both have E7, but then you have super point in higher dimensions. 
it's very much steam now for four dimensions, but w I mean, we have, uh, no, what we have done, we have in fact uh, done it in, in, in also in, in 11 dimensions by what people used to call oxidations. Actually, th th this is, um, actually, it's quite interesting, you know, because somehow, what is it that's really telling you that the, the, that the n equals eight, that it's an 11 dimension theory. It's really the spinners because, you know, um, all the information is in the spinners. And because when, we, when we did n equals four, we started in 10 dimensions and we, we would just decompose the spinners and we got four spinners. And, um, and, and, and the way to do it is to do, you can take over essentially the expressions. And um, every time we have a, a derivative like that, which is in two. Uh, we have to add to it some terms here, you know, with, for example, well, in, in the young mid case, we, we write something like that, and we have some theta, or d d theta or something. Well, I, idea is not. Um, so one can construct a new derivative. So essentially what you do when you, you go to higher dimensions is to add in the um, coordinates and write a new derivative. And the, the, so, so then you can write also the 10 dimension case and the 11 dimension case in, in a very compact form. I'm not sure that this quadratic form is working though. We have not been able to show that. Is there indications that the, the, the remaining symmetry should be something like five dimensional homomorphic vector field? So five components. Yeah. 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 No. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. But when you say the algebra does not close, what does it give? It gives something that could have some meaning, or it's just really strongly non-zero and you. Sorry, but the, the, the when you say the algebra does not close, what the. Well, you know, of course, the, the, I was in a sense I was not hiding it, but. Usually, when you have conformal invariance, you would make you say that you you, you have delta x is and delta x bar, you know, is one with for us it's the opposite. That and of course that then it's clear that the, it, that's you're going to mix up x with an x bar, and then you're out in in the whole, uh, uh, and then you go on. Um, uh, and I, well, I, I don't, at this level, you know, it, it works just like Virasora, but once you get to, to, to try to close it, it doesn't, which means that we don't n know anything about C numbers or so in this algebra. I'm, I'm just using this as an infinitesimal transformation, which the theory should be invariant under. Uh, and then it, it, it does, it works in the way that it gives us the right terms, but I cannot use it as some underlying geometry, which I would have liked to do. But, but somehow, I feel there is one, but I haven't been able to see it. But sorry, if the algebra does not close itself, I don't see how it can be a symmetry. Usually what you have is that well, the algebra closed, but when you write the algebra on the field, it's only close up to the equation of motion, and then it's open. But in your case, yeah. you to say that even the algebra itself does not close. Well, it, no, the algebra closes, in, but, but it doesn't... What I'm saying is that then you have to introduce new transformations, you know. Uh, it, it, the algebra will eventually close, but it will close into more uh, transformations than the one I'm writing here. But I don't need them, you know, in order to just check this. But in order to understand the, the full symmetry, I have to do that. So, so what, I would, what I would have liked to do is to, to find some sub-algebra sub which was closing of the whole remaining, but this I've not been able to find. Also, find a bigger algebra. Well, yeah. It, okay, I haven't been able to to really get anything interesting out of that. But. Other questions? Okay, let's end. Okay.